Hey guys, Unit 5, the Cellular Toolbox. This is a way you want to think about cells not by the parts they have, which is the way you've learned it before. You know, they have mitochondria, they have Golgi apparatus, they have all this stuff. Instead of thinking of it that way, you want to think about what cells can do. Instead of what they have, think about what they can do. And we'll see how that all adds up to the things that they have. Um, and it becomes a lot more useful because you're going to get asked a lot more about what cells can do and how they're going to accomplish certain tasks. And there are certain uniform, you know, molecules that have been used the same way for since life first appeared on Earth. So since we're talking about cells, we're going to start out with talking about cell theory, of course. We always start here. Um, three basic tenets of cell theory. Living things are made up of cells. Cell is the fundamental unit of life. Like if you go smaller than a cell, then you're not really talking about living things anymore. And cells come from other cells, which has some interesting implications, of course, but um, it's pretty straightforward. It should make sense. You know, you were once a single cell, and before that, uh, that was your, you know, a sperm and an egg. And those are cells, too, and those came from meiosis in your parents. So, you know, the cells come from cells. Just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, we want to make sure we're all on the same page as far as size go. Your cells are typical eukaryotic cells. Most of your body cells are roughly the same size. Now, some of them are ridiculously long. You have muscle cells that may be 30 centimeters long and full of nuclei. You can have neurons that are, you know, a meter long in your leg that may run, you know, it's a single cell that runs from your spine to the tip of your toe, but those aren't typical. Most of your cells are fairly cylindrical or box shaped and compared to a bacterial cell, they're much larger. So the way I always describe it when I'm in the classroom is I, I say, imagine the classroom is the size of a typical cell. Um, and then a bacterial cell would probably be closer to the size of a football or a basketball. And then a virus would be, you know, a virus is not a cell at all, but even those that do have a phospholipid membrane, which some do, um, such as our coronavirus, those that have that envelope uh, would be, you know, maybe the size of a Tic Tac or like an ibuprofen tablet. They'd be much, much smaller still than a bacterial cell. So there's going to be a lot of little questions here on these first few slides that tell you to high five your neighbor. If you're watching the video with someone else, which I always recommend, Pause the video and see if you guys can hammer out an answer to the question. So this first one, mouse can fall out of an airplane and walk away after it hits the ground. Uh, an elephant can be killed by a fall of only 10 feet. So those two things are both true. Why this discrepancy between these two things? Here's another question. Imagine an animal with the mass of an elephant, but capable of surviving that fall out of an airplane like a mouse did. What would it have to be like? Pause the video and answer that. Here's another question. We have protists that are single cell, right? Or, or cyanobacteria, they don't have leaves. Photosynthetic single-celled organisms don't have leaves. What's the purpose of a leaf? Why so many of these leaves? And what does that have to do with this statement that insects don't have lungs? Those two things are both related and they're also related to the other questions I just asked you. So insects don't need lungs. Some do, larger insects are gonna have um, some tubes going into them, but they won't be lungs. They won't be proper, you know, breathing gas exchange lungs. They just have tubes going in that allow for gas exchange. So think about why an insect doesn't need big fancy lungs, and we do. So hopefully you're seeing from all of these is that we're talking about volume or mass, how it's related to surface area. Every one of these was about surface area and mass or surface area and volume. So being large has its challenges. Being large means you have to have adaptations that increase your surface area for gas exchange, for example. That's why we have these big fancy lungs with, you know, half a volleyball court worth of surface area where gas exchange can occur. And an insect doesn't need that at all because the gases don't have to go very far because surface area to volume, they're all, every one of their cells is very close to the air. Whereas ours, some of these cells are very deep and very far from the air. We have the added complication that being land animals, we all have to like keep ourselves from drying out. So we have to have a waterproof barrier, which generally means it's vapor proof also. It doesn't allow gases to move through it as well. Leaves are about increasing surface area for more exposure to sunlight, also more places where they can do gas exchange because gas exchange does occur inside of the leaves.
an elephant that could fall out of an airplane and not die would have to be shaped like a gigantic kite, like a huge blanket. would have to have a surface area like a glider uh, to be able to survive that fall. So when you're looking at cell size, cells are small and typically very small. Think about a hypothetical cell that was really big. So think about its demand for resources. As the cell gets bigger, it needs more stuff, right? It's going to need more glucose. It's going to need more amino acids. It's going to need more oxygen. It's going to have a much greater demand for resources. All of these resources are coming from outside of this cell. So if you think about the surface area to volume ratio, as this gets larger, right? Something like an elephant has a much smaller surface area to volume ratio than a mouse. If you think about the surface area compared to the volume, we'll look at the math here in a second, but the larger you are, the smaller your surface area to volume ratio will be. Since these things have to diffuse in from the outside, having a smaller cell means a greater surface area to volume ratio. So the, we are able to access these resources at a rate high enough that we can use them and keep the cell alive. If you get too big, the time you spend waiting for diffusion, even just to get from one part of the cell to another, is going to be too slow and it may cause the cell to die. Not to mention the inherent vulnerabilities of being just a big bag of juice. So as a cell gets bigger, its ability to fulfill the demand for its resources would be dropping because its surface area to volume ratio is, is going down and it has a greater demand. So it has a greater demand of resources, but it has less surface area per volume to be able to get those resources. So you can think of the volume as the demand for the resources and the surface area as the access to the resources. We want that ratio to be big. And so why are cells small? Hopefully I've kind of covered that. It's really about being able to fulfill the resource demands through absorption through a membrane. Right, we have to be able to get those resources into the cell. And if you get too big, your demand for resources is going to be too great for the surface area to be able to accommodate. So small cells means we're able to keep that demand satisfied through that surface area of the membrane. Like I said, the math looks a lot like this. Um, think about one of these cubes. I got a small cube like this. It's got a surface area of six, you know, add that up. It's going to be six one by one squares, right? It has a total volume of one, one times one times one is the volume. Surface area to volume would be six to one. So that'd be six. Whereas if you have a larger cube, say a cube that's five times as large, well, this value gets bigger, but not as quickly as this value gets bigger. So now these two values are pretty similar. We end up with only a 1.2 surface area to volume ratio. And if we increase this five to a larger number, this value is going down still. So you can have this same amount of volume in small cells and have a surface area to volume ratio that's the same as this tiny little box while still maintaining the volume of the larger thing. So being made up of a bunch of small things allows you to be able to have that ratio. If you were to do this for a sphere, you would get this equation, which I think you could probably figure that out, right? Surface area divided by the volume. Just take the equations for those two. You're, the pi is going to cancel out. You're going to end up with three over X because it's going to be uh, four thirds. The three is going to end up on the top. So anyway, you're going to get an equation that's three over X and that graph looks like this. And so you can see as the radius gets larger, and we're getting less and less surface area to volume. It's definitely advantageous to be down here where you have a much higher surface area to volume ratio. So being small is the effective way to transport materials for the demands of a cell. And sometimes being small isn't good enough. Sometimes even a tiny cell has a greater demand for surface area interaction. Um, and in that case, we're gonna have some kind of adaptation on the cell that gives it more surface area. This picture here on the right, this is a transmission electron micrograph. Um, so basically it looks like a slide. It's like a slice. So here's actually, this is two cells. There's a cell here. Here's the cell membranes between these two, but you can see these guys have microvilli. This is the lining of their small intestine. And these microvilli dramatically increase the surface area. I mean, if you imagine this was just smooth across here, the amount of surface area it has compared to with all of these microvilli here is much, much smaller. So we would have food here, glucose and amino acids and other things our body needs. Increasing this surface area means, means we get a lot more of this as that food goes by absorbed into the cell. So it gives us a lot more opportunity to grab those molecules. This is a, a root cell. 
And on the root cell, there are these tiny little microscopic root hairs that increase the surface area so that the cell can absorb things like nitrates and magnesium and other compounds that it has a demand for, including, of course, water. And we'll see there are other adaptations that come with plants, too, to, to, to increase that, but even on a cellular level. So these are small, small cells, regular size, eukaryotic cells, very small, but even that is not enough surface area because they have a job that demands that they absorb a lot of material. And so they increase the surface area. So if being small is so beneficial, why should we be multicellular? Why grow to large sizes? Why be an elephant if you know, you're just gonna fall off of things and die all the time? Actually, that's not an elephant's biggest problems. But how is that advantageous to be big and multicellular? If the resource to you know, expense ratio is so much better when you're small. See if you can pause the video and kind of hash that out. And maybe you'll even notice that there's something kind of wrong with the question. So being small is super beneficial. The vast majority of life on earth is small, right? Bacteria, bacteria sitting in your chair right now, vastly outnumber your cells. You, the multicellular organism sitting there, you are outnumbered by bacterial cells sitting in your chair. And most of those are in your small intestine, but some of them are on your skin um, and your clothes and things like that. But those bacteria way outnumber your cells but they're a lot smaller. So they're not doing badly. Being, being small is beneficial. Being small is the most popular way for organisms to make a living here on earth by far. But it's not like that prevents anything from being multicellular. And being multicellular gives you some new kind of possibilities. It gives you stability of your environment. If you're big, the inside of you is able to be maintained in such a way that you can keep conditions right for life. Every bacterium is immensely susceptible to any change in the environment. Whereas, you know, we can go places that's very cold, very hot. We can get, you know, acid splashed on us. We can get other chemicals splashed on us. We can come near a fire. All these things that would dry out and kill a bacteria or damage a bacterium and kill it immediately. We're able to survive all kinds of stuff. Plus, we can move to where those conditions are not there, where bacteria is just like, if this is what happens here, this is what you died in. Whereas if you're a multicellular large organism that can move, you can go someplace else. So it's a bigger investment, but it's also a bigger payoff. And you want to remember that it's not like there's a winner, right? It's not like this is the ultimate, right? This is just a snapshot of what has worked so far. And so everything that you see here on earth that's alive is a thing that has worked and its ancestors, it worked for its ancestors as well. And it's been changing as the environment changes, of course, but it's the stuff that still works. All right, so here's these lying pictures of cells. Um, there are no cells. Well, the plant cell may be similar to this, but this cell on the left that's supposed to be an animal cell, there is no animal cell in the world that is like this, that has one random flagellum plus some microvilli plus, you know, some gold, just a little bit of everything. Cells in an animal are specialized. They are not this general little bit of everything nonsense that you see here. Of course, eukaryotic cells have a true nucleus. Prokaryotic cells do not. The DNA is typically bundled together in a little knot, but that's not a nucleus. It's just there. Um, it is directly in the cytoplasm. And we'll talk about the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes in a little bit. Eukaryotic cells have membrane-bound organelles like vacuoles or chloroplasts or Golgi apparatus, things like that. But like I said, cell parts is not as important as what cells do. So we need to be focused on that, on what they can do. So cells are very complicated, but all these complicated things they do is really just combinations of a few fundamental proteins doing their job. So let's dive right in. First tool we've talked about before, it's enzymes. Enzymes catalyze chemical reactions, they are catalysts. In fact, you can think of them as making the chemical reactions occur for life, right? The, these reactions wouldn't occur in any kind of useful way if the enzyme wasn't there making it happen. So they make chemical changes. They break things, they build things. So examples like lactase. Lactase is the enzyme that breaks lactose. This is the thing you're lacking if you're lactose intolerant, which is typical for mammals. Adult mammals typically are lactose intolerant. Lactase is a gene that normally shuts off not long after infancy because you don't digest milk if you're a mammal unless you're breastfeeding. There have been a few populations of, on Earth of humans that have been dependent on cows or goats as an energy source using dairy instead of meat. 
for a long enough period of time that they have adapted a, a permanently switched on version of lactase. Like having this enzyme switched on all the time gave you access to more calories over those that couldn't digest lactose. But most of the world is actually lactose intolerant. It's really just a few populations, people from ans with ancestors from Northern Europe and a couple of places in Africa. Rubisco, we talked about, probably the most numerous and important enzyme in the world, does carbon dioxide fixation, takes carbon dioxide, and makes organic molecules. That's an enzyme. ATP synthase, it has two functions because it was a channel and it's an enzyme. It takes ADP and an inorganic phosphate and puts them together to make ATP with that third phosphate. Okay, so enzymes I feel like we're pretty good on, but that's our first tool, being able to make chemical reactions happen when and where we want to. Our second tool is internal membranes. So having membrane-bound organelles in eukaryotic cells, these are useful. They can be big, they can be small, they can have vast surface area, but they allow us to isolate certain mechanisms. They allow us to isolate processes that would be damaging to the rest of the cell. I mean, think about just the DNA. Having a nuclear envelope, that membrane around the, the DNA in the nucleus, it keeps the DNA from being involved in chemical reactions out in the cytoplasm. So we can do all kinds of chemistry out in the cytoplasm without risking damaging the DNA. While we don't mind some changes in DNA because that fuels the diversity for evolution, but if you're multicellular, you need to keep that number down because mutations can cause you know, cancer and things like, and birth defects and things like that. So as multicellular organisms, we keep that mutation rate down. We also have things like lysosomes. The lysosome is a digestive organelle, so it's filled with acid and digestive enzymes. You can't have those just floating around in the cytoplasm. It'll digest your cells, the living part of your cells and all the enzymes and proteins and things that you want to you know, do the stuff that you do to be alive, that will all be destroyed. So you need those contained. So having these membranes inside of the cell, that allows you to isolate different processes so they don't interfere with each other. We can also use these membranes to generate a concentration gradient. We'll talk a lot more about that later, but basically we can make it so on one side of a membrane, there's a whole bunch of something, and on the other side, there's very little, like it could be sodium or it could be hydrogen ions or something like that. We can make a concentration gradient, and that becomes very useful later on. We'll talk about concentration gradients. Our third tool is how we move things across membranes, which is what we were just kind of talking about. So we have channels and pumps. So some things can move right through the membrane. Some things move through the membrane through a channel, through a hole basically in the membrane, and some things have to be pumped across the membrane. This will make a little more sense when we've talked about the properties of the cellular membrane, but I think you probably remember this phospholipid bilayer and that this area through here is hydrophobic. And so things like water or anything with a charge is not happy in there and it's not gonna make it through that. There are some molecules that can go straight through the membrane as if it's not even there. And these are gases like small non-polar molecules like O2 or CO2 or nitrogen gas, they'll all go right through, and hydrophobic molecules. Because again, this is a hydrophobic zone. So anything hydrophobic has no problem in there. In fact, anything hydrophobic is gonna have more problem in outside the cell or inside the cell in that watery substance. It's gonna usually have some kind of escort protein helping it move because otherwise it would just stay trapped somewhere in some hydrophobic location. But they go right through that membrane. So two things, gases and hydrophobic molecules, lipids basically. Some molecules require some assistance to move through the membrane and that is anything that is hydrophilic, right? Anything that has a charge, anything that's polar, salts, glucose, uh, most of your small amino acids, they're gonna need a channel. And so we'll build something through the membrane. So we have channels and we have pumps. And the difference between a channel and pump should be pretty intuitive. You know that a channel is just basically a way to go and a pump requires energy. So a pump requires ATP. And so the reason you need a pump sometimes instead of a channel, it's all about that concentration gradient. If you have more of something on one side than the other, and we'll talk more about this later, but if we're going against the concentration gradient, we need a pump. If you're going with the concentration gradient, meaning along the concentration gradient, or sometimes we say down the concentration gradient, you just open the door and it's gonna go from more concentrated to less concentrated, that's just diffusion. So if you got more concentrated, less concentrated, and a membrane, if you're going that way, you need a pump. If you're going this way, you need a channel. They come in slightly different types. Um, some of them have you know, the ability to open and close. Some are open all the time. Some pumps only work under certain conditions, but it's just about diffusion, right? So if you wanted to move this way, you would just need a channel. If you wanted to move this way, you would need a pump. What they have in common is that they are proteins. 
They are transmembrane, meaning they go across the membrane from one side to the other. And they are specific. They only work on one thing. A lot like enzymes we talked about before, they only do one thing. So if I have a channel that allows sodium ions through, it's not going to let chloride ions through. It's not going to let potassium ions through. It's only going to let sodium ions through. They're very specific. So here's a common molecule. The sodium potassium pump is a protein that we find in a lot of cell membranes. Pretty much all of, our, all of your cell membranes have this. They always pump the sodium out of the cell. They always pump potassium into the cell. They're actually a pump that works in both ways at the same time. They use spend ATP to pump three sodiums out and two potassiums in. So what do you know in a typical cell about the concentration of these ions? Well, there's a lot more sodium out than there is inside, and there's a lot more potassium inside than there is outside because the pumps are always running and they're always doing this. So channels can also be gated, meaning that they can be turned off or turned on, or they can be opened or closed. And we can do this in a couple of different ways. A lot of channels are just open all the time. You have aquaporins in almost all of your cells. Aquaporins are holes that allow water to move through and they are always open. But we can have them act as a receptor. So they bind some molecule and when, some mo when this little green molecule comes along, it's called a ligand, we'll talk more about that here in a minute. When that comes along, that causes this channel to open. When that guy's not there, the channel is closed. And this is like how neurons work and how your muscles get receive signals. Like this little green guy would be like a neurotransmitter and it would bind to a receptor on the muscle cell and that would cause a channel to open and that would cause you to you know, initiate the process that tells you to flex the muscle. You can also have um, voltage gated channels. So as we pump these ions, we make what's called a membrane potential. So it becomes very positive out here and it becomes negative in here because we're pumping out a bunch of positive stuff. And so if something happens to make this become more positive on the inside and more negative on the outside, then it'll open the channel. That's the kind of thing that can happen. The change in voltage can make a channel open so the cell can do something because the voltage changed. And we call that voltage gated. So this is ligand gated over here, and this is voltage gated over here. So our fourth tool in the toolbox are vesicles. Vesicles are little bubbles of cell membrane, just really small little pockets, little things that we can transport around and still keep it inside that little package. So where they come from is usually from like the endoplasmic reticulum or the Golgi apparatus. And you've got a cell membrane and they will bud off and pinch off just a piece of that cell membrane. So they'll take a little piece of the cell membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum and that can be transported somewhere else in the cell. And then we can fuse it to another membrane and put whatever was inside of it into that other membrane. Or sometimes we can do that outside of the cell. And this is how we secrete things. So there's a set of proteins that are, can be activated that will make a vesicle happen or they can make a vesicle fuse, right? And there's just a variety of different proteins that kind of take cytoskeleton and grab a hold of the membrane and they're able to shape a little bubble and then you can transport that around. You can have these sitting inside of a cell membrane and just waiting and then at a certain signal, you can secrete whatever is inside those outside of the cell. This is how we do like digestive juices as you'll see here in a minute. I got a little video that shows this. You can see there's a vesicle budding off there and then it's fusing to the Golgi. And then we can bud a vesicle off of the Golgi and fuse that to say a lysosome or fuse it to the cell membrane. And this is how we secrete things. So we just secreted whatever this yellow protein is here. Um, we can also fuse it to a lysosome and that's how we get the digestive enzymes into the lysosome so that when we wanna digest something that we bring in from the outside of the cell. So you can see a lot of vesicle transport happen there between the ER and the Golgi, the Golgi and the cell membrane, the Golgi and the lysosome, between the membrane and the lysosome, there's a whole network of movement of membrane. We call this the endomembrane system, and it, there's constant movement. So, and you can kind of think of the inside of the endoplasmic reticulum, the inside of the Golgi, those are kind of analogous to the outside because it's that membrane has cytoplasm on one side and outside on the other side. But we also bring in vesicles from the cell membrane that will fuse with the ER. So we end up with the whole cycle of the membrane moving around and around. We'll talk more about that later. Another thing we have in cells is motor proteins. And this is how we make movement happen inside the cell. Those vesicles we were just shipping around, they are actually hauled by motor proteins to do that. Motor proteins will grab a hold of that and they will walk on cytoskeleton on microtubules to take that vesicle to a specific location. So motor proteins always walk on or pull on cytoskeletal fibers. So either microtubules or actin fibers. 
Those are two cytoskeletal proteins we'll talk about later. So they walk on cytoskeleton. This bottom gift GIF right here, that's our motor protein hauling a vesicle. That great big bubble behind it is one of those vesicles, and it's walking on a microtubule. This upper picture here, this upper GIF GIF, so this is a myosin protein pulling on actin, and what it does is actin's the cytoskeleton, myosin's the motor protein, and this is how muscles contract. It's a whole bunch of these little guys working together to contract muscles. So motor proteins are how we move things around. And we can change the shape of a cell by moving fibers against each other. Um, when we talk about cell division, when we go to divide the cytoplasm and cytokinesis, we'll take a bunch of actin and cinch it together, cinch it down with motor proteins, walk it down, and that will separate the cells. Um, to wave a tail of, an, of a sperm cell, for example, it's motor proteins on two major microtubules inside of the tail, the flagellum of the sperm. So the motor proteins walk and then they let go and then they walk and then they let go. And so that does this basically to it and it makes the whole tail flat back and forth. And this is how a sperm can swim, just motor proteins walking on cytoskeleton. So we have receptors in cells too. And these are proteins whose job it is, is to receive some molecule, to bind some molecule. So typically when we talk about receptors, we're talking about membrane receptors and they're embedded in the cell membrane and they have some ligand, some molecule that will bind to them. So receptor is a molecule that can detect the presence of some other molecule by binding to it. That other molecule is called a ligand, and maybe that's a hormone from outside you know, the cell. Maybe it's adrenaline, and it's telling your liver cell to release a bunch of sugar or something like that, but you've got a receptor in the membrane. And then the other end of the protein is inside of the cell. So without the signal coming into the cell, we can tell the inside of the cell, hey, this is out there. And so receptors are proteins that can do that. They can receive a signal on the outside and do something about it on the inside of the cell. The thing that binds the receptor is called a ligand. Now, we have ligands binding receptors in cell membranes, but we also have steroid hormone receptors. So the receptor is intracellular when it's a steroid hormone. So we have two different categories of hormones. We'll talk more about these later, but there are protein hormones and there are steroid hormones. And protein hormones, um, they're hydrophilic, and so they don't go through membranes. Steroid hormones, steroids are hydrophobic, they're lipids, right? So they go right through the membrane, no problem. So their receptor is actually inside the cell, so we call it an intracellular receptor. So the steroid hormone travels through the membrane without any help, it's not facilitated diffusion, there's no channel, there's no pump, it goes right through and it will bind an intracellular receptor. And then that complex together becomes, usually it becomes a transcription factor and we'll talk more about that later. But, so there are a couple of different kinds of receptors, but usually when we talk about receptors, we're talking about this first kind that are embedded in the membrane. Most receptors, like I said, are transmembrane proteins. It means across the membrane. There's part of them outside and part of them inside and they go all the way through. So when a ligand binds a receptor, all kinds of things can happen, right? This particular situation um, is, is another one of our tools in the toolbox that we'll get here get to here in a minute. But here's our ligand binding the receptor. And then that makes some, you know, the inside will become an enzyme. So this part of the receptor has enzyme function, which causes some reaction to happen, which kicks off a whole chain of reaction inside the cell that eventually leads to some cellular response. This guy is here, let's do this. When we were talking about channels, I said ligand gated channels. This is a combination of a receptor and this channel. So a receptor channel combination, that's how you get this ligand gated channel because this guy is a receptor right here. And when it receives the ligand, when it binds the ligand, then the channel opens. So we have these combinations. Like I said, ATP synthase is part enzyme, part channel because it lets the hydrogen ions come back through and it uses that gradient, that, that movement to power the enzyme function of turning ADP and an inorganic phosphate into ATP, which we talked about in first semester. So the next tool in our toolbox is called a kinase cascade. And I actually just looked at that right here. That's what's going on here. Kinases are enzymes that uh, activate other proteins. They do this by attaching a phosphate group. So like a PO4 with a three minus charge and stick it onto some other protein and sticking that phosphate on there activates that protein. Remember, whenever you stick something on a protein or take something off a protein, the protein changes shape and can do something different. Um, we talked about that quite a bit with the electron transport chain. As we pass those electrons, we change the shape and allow them to pump protons. Anytime you stick something to or take something off of a protein, you change its shape. And when you change its shape, you change its function. Usually it's just turning off and on. But in this case, we're gonna be, you know, so here's our receptor, receives the signal. 
it activates some protein, which activates some protein. And each of these guys along the way is activating a bunch of proteins. And so this guy turns on a bunch of this secondary messenger called cyclic AMP, which kicks off a bunch of these guys, which kicks off a bunch of these guys. And eventually we get this cellular response. So we took one little signal molecule here, attach it to a receptor, and now the entire cell is responding. We got huge amounts of amplification because every time each one of these guys, when they get active, they activate dozens of more. And so then one of those guys, each of those activates dozens more and each of those activates dozens more. And so very quickly, the entire cell is responding to that one signal on the outside. So the idea here is that we could have a big and quick cellular response to a very small signal. This is the way adrenaline works, right? The adrenaline gets dumped into your blood. All the cells that have receptors, are gonna to respond to this and they're gonna respond quickly, right? You have to respond quickly to adrenaline. It's to fire you up to fight or flee or whatever. You know, the tiger comes into the room, you've got to be able to run away from it or fight the tiger, whatever. And you have to be able to do that fast. So we need a quick response. So all these cells have to do their thing quickly. And so we get this massive amplification through the use of a kinase cascade. The last couple tools we won't talk about too much until later, nucleic acid polymerase complexes. These are things that build nucleic acids. So we have DNA polymerase. There's a bunch of enzymes actually working together as a team to copy DNA. When we want to go through cell division, for example, we've got to copy the DNA first. Um, or when we make a transcript, when we're going to make a protein, we make a copy of the DNA that is RNA. We still need a, a nucleic acid polymerase, right? We need an RNA polymerase instead of a DNA polymerase. So we make an RNA copy of that DNA that we can then use to make the protein out in the cytoplasm with the ribosome. And we use base pair rules, right? So, you know, an A goes with a T, a C goes with a G, or in the case of building RNA, right? If you've got an A, then you're gonna put a U instead of a T. I'm sure you remember that, A, T, C, G for DNA, and A, U, C, G for RNA. So you use the uracil instead of thymine if you're building RNA, but otherwise they're basically the same. But we're gonna use base pair rules to match the sequence that is there. And then we have transcription factors, which again are kind of a genetics thing there. These are proteins that bind to the DNA and say, this gene right here, we want this active now. And this is really important for you know the differentiation between one cell and another. The difference between a pancreatic cell and a nerve cell is what proteins are there. And what proteins are there is totally determined by what transcription factors are active, telling the RNA polymerase, we need this protein, we need this protein, we need this protein. Which genes you have active producing proteins, that's what determines what type of cell you have. So a brain cell is different from a pancreatic cell because of which transcription factors are saying, make this one. You're not gonna make this, the proteins that are necessary for nerve function in a pancreas, you don't need that. So those are shut off and you just have the pancreatic genes turned on. So this is part of that whole central dogma, DNA, RNA, protein, making proteins, protein synthesis. It's right there at the regulation of the DNA, which genes are we making? And we'll spend a lot of time talking about that later on when we do genetics. If you remember when we were talking about that intracellular receptor for steroid hormones, this receptor binds the hormone, that combination together, those always become what's called a transcription factor. So those come down here, bind to the DNA and say, make this thing. So this is not a quick response. This, yeah, these are always going to be a much slower response. This is like, you know, grow a beard or, you know, some other sexual characteristics. These are steroid hormones, things like testosterone and estrogens. Those are all steroid hormones. So they're not quick responses. This, you know, a tiger doesn't come into the room and you need to grow a beard quickly. This is not something that happens quickly. This happens over years. So I want to show you examples of a bunch of these tools put to use into a process that happens inside your body. You don't need to take notes on all of this. In fact, none of this is, you know, None of these specific examples are relevant. You need to know those tools, but you're always going to see them in different situations. So I'm just going to show you one situation. I actually recommend you don't take notes on this part. Just pay attention and see those tools come up. So I want to show you how a pancreatic cell secretes digestive enzymes into the small intestine. I've got this tube coming from the pancreas into the small intestine. I want to take pancreatic cells in the pancreas and I want to dump enzymes into that tube. That's all I want to do. And I want to do it at an appropriate time. I want to do it when there's food here. I don't want to waste these enzymes. These are proteins. They're an investment. So only when there's food here. So let me show you how all this comes together. And it's just these tools. So pay attention, but don't take notes. So the pancreatic cell has calcium pumps running all the time. It's pumping calcium outside the cell. So calcium is being pumped out all the time. So we have a concentration gradient. 
lots of calcium outside. It's also pumping it into the ER and into the Golgi and things like that. So there's lots of calcium, but not in the cytoplasm. We've already made a bunch of vesicles. We call them granules. When they're vesicles that hang around for a while until some signal is, re is received, we usually call those granules. So here they all are sitting here, and these are those digestive enzymes. So when it's time to digest a meal, we're going to secrete these. We're going to fuse those vesicles to the membrane and dump their contents into that tube that's going to go to the small intestine. So a couple of things. How do we get those vesicles here, and how do we know when it's time to secrete them? So first, let's look at those granules, those vesicles filled with digestive enzymes that were all sitting right here at the membrane ready to go. So we start in the nucleus with DNA. We have genes for those digestive enzymes. We have codes, recipes for those digestive enzymes, for the proteins. So we make a copy of that using transcription factors saying, use this one here because we're a pancreatic cell. And we're going to have an RNA polymerase build that mRNA. So we're already up to two tools. That RNA can then leave to the cytoplasm. It's going to bind a ribosome there. That ribosome is going to take that RNA to the endoplasmic reticulum, and it's going to build the protein into the lumen, into the inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. And that looks like this. Here's the, RNA, here's the ribosome. That strand going by is the RNA. And right down there, it's building that protein. So now the protein is inside the endoplasmic reticulum, and it'll float around in there for a bit, but eventually it will butt off and make a vesicle. And that vesicle is then carried by a motor protein walking down a microtubule from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus, and there it fuses and dumps its contents into the Golgi. So now that protein, that digestive enzyme, it may be getting modified here in the Golgi in some ways, but it's going to travel from the Golgi, but off another vesicle. We're going to do another motor protein walking with, walking with this thing. It's going to take it to the cell membrane, but we're not going to fuse yet. The proteins that make these vesicles fuse are activated by calcium. And we've already been pumping calcium out the whole time. So there's lots of calcium out here. There's lots of calcium in here. There's lots of calcium in here, but there's almost none in the cytoplasm. But if there's calcium in the cytoplasm, then we're going to fuse these vesicles. So here's a bunch of words saying what I just said. And this is for when, you know, you're looking at the PowerPoint without me around. The ribosome acts like an enzyme to build proteins. We have a motor protein. We have a vesicle. I mean, all these tools are here. So now we've got these vesicles lined up, those granules, right? Those vesicles lined up, ready to go. We used a bunch of tools to get them here. When your stomach dumps the acid chyme. So chyme is just a mixture of your food and the stomach acid that gets churned up, you know, it gets formed in the stomach, takes your food, adds acid to it, churns it up, has some digestive enzymes that help start chopping up the proteins. Proteins are getting denatured because of the acid, right? When that moves into the small intestine, there's receptors in the wall of the small intestine that then tell those cells to secrete a hormone. So there's a hormone that gets dumped into your blood and it goes everywhere. And it's called CCK. It goes everywhere in your body, all through your circulatory system. But most cells don't respond to CCK because most cells don't have the receptor. The cells of the pancreas have that receptor, these cells with the granules filled with digestive enzymes. So now this is how this cell knows there's food in the small intestine because acid triggered the receptors in the wall of the small intestine and those cells dumped out CCK. CCK binds to the receptor in these cells. Those, that receptor kicks off a kinase cascade that eventually leads to the intake of calcium. It opens calcium channels in the ER, the Golgi, and in the cell membrane. So calcium floods into the cell. And when the calcium floods into the cell, that activates the proteins that cause these vesicles to fuse. And the vesicles fuse to the membrane and they dump their contents into the pancreatic duct. And so we've just secreted those proteins into the duct. And that was our goal from the beginning. But you see how this is a fairly complicated process, but all it was were tools from that toolbox every single step along the way. So that's kind of a lot to take in today, um, but that cellular toolbox, that will be the most valuable thing you have when you go to take the AP exam or my cell test, which is, you know, down the road here pretty soon. So you guys are doing great. Hang in there. Remember, email me if you got questions.